Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to our second event for the lecture concert series for the 2021-22 school year. We are very excited today to have our Halloween lecture. I'm very excited because this year I get the year off and I get to just listen to my wonderful colleague, uh, Dr. Jake Marquess, is our lecturer today. He's Professor of Biology, originally from Spokane, Washington, correct? And has been here with us since 2012. And he has many hobbies, one of which is collecting insects, which is the beginning of a great horror movie right there. So uh, he's going to be sharing a lot of things with us to give us a lot to think about as we're getting into the Halloween season. So I'm um, very interested to hear this, and I've had the great honor of serving on some committees with Dr. Marquess, and I'm very excited to hear this lecture. So without any further ado, please welcome Dr. Marquess. Get this adjusted real quick. Is that okay? Well, thank you very much for the kind introduction, Dr. Bristow. Uh, I am also very excited to be here today uh, to talk to you a little bit about zombie animals. And uh, I'm really impressed by this graphic. Uh, this was designed by Jason Marzuski, uh, and it combines one of my other uh, interests and hobbies, and that's old insect horror films. Uh, I'm a big fan of the 1950s, 1960s horror films with giant ants and giant praying mantises terrorizing uh, innocent people. And um, what I would like to talk to you a little bit about today is real-life zombies. Okay. Now, before we get into that, I have a quick question for those in the audience. When was the last time that you saw a zombie movie television show? Was it within the last six months? Okay. Within the last three months? I saw one last night. <laughs> okay. Now, as you look at the zombies that you see on television and in movies, uh, predominantly these, these zombies are flesh-eating zombies, right? They're, they're chasing after humans, they're devouring flesh, and potentially brains. Okay? But this is not uh, the mythological zombie. Okay? In fact, zombies are of uh, Haitian folklore, and they were reanimated corpses, okay, where magic, or voodoo, uh, was used to bring back a servant or a slave. Okay? So a witch would use a corpse, perform voodoo magic, and bring back this servant or slave. Okay? Now, not flesh eating at this time. Okay? That changes in 1968. Okay? Very famous, controversial movie, Night of the Living Dead. Okay? So it's at this point that we see a transition in the mythological zombie, magic-induced servant, to a flesh-eating uh, monster. Okay. All right, so, it's, I believe this is off of The Walking Dead. Um, so, the other thing that changes is the cause. Okay. So, it's no longer magic. Okay. Now, it's potentially an environmental effect. Uh, in Night of the Living Dead, it was radiation. Okay. Uh, a lot of what you're seeing today is viruses, pathogens, okay, that infect um, a, a human and cause them to turn into a zombie. And it's transmitted by a bite of another zombie. Okay. Very similar to how rabies is transmitted. Okay. Sometimes it only takes dancing. Okay. A really good song, and you turn into a zombie. Okay. All right, so zombies, what we see in television today, right, a dead organism right, that is spreading a pathogen, a virus, something to other individuals, causing them to turn into a zombie. Uh, there actually is a zombie animals movie where that, in fact, happens. Okay. Well, that's not what we're going to see today, okay. because we're going to look at biological zombies. Okay. And it's slightly different, 
Right? Because in biological zombies, the organism that is controlling the, uh, the other organism is doing it for a specific purpose. Right? So it has an unsurprising name here in, in biology. It's called zombification. Right? Now, zombification comes from symbiosis, from two organisms living closely together. Now, when you may think of symbiosis as mutualism, right? Everybody's getting along. Nemo's hanging out with the jellyfish, and everybody's happy, right? But there's another form of symbiosis, and that's parasitism. And so in parasitism, this symbiotic relationship is between a host and parasite, okay? And the host is harmed to the benefit of the parasite. Okay? Now, for the most part, some of these relationships will not kill the host. Okay? So this is a tongue-eating louse, okay? and it does exactly what the name implies. Okay? It comes in through the gills of the fish and consumes the tongue, okay? and then it serves as the tongue. Okay. And it feeds off of the blood and mucus uh, uh, produced by the fish, okay. but really it's not harming the fish. They may be a little underweight, okay. but it's not killing the fish. Okay. Now, where we can see potentially the death of one of the hosts is in the intermediate steps. Okay. So we have to ask, what is your final destination? Okay. Many times, parasites have multiple hosts. Okay. So I'm going to throw a few terms at you here. Intermediary hosts, and then our definitive or final host. Okay. For the most part, the definitive host is not harmed. Okay. For the most part. It's the intermediate host Okay, where potentially we're going to see that zombie behavior because it's going to cause the uh, intermediate host to do something that it wouldn't normally do. Okay. So repeat after me. Devour the host's inside. Okay. Excellent. Alter behavior to enhance transmission. Burst out of host body. Now, that is optional, yes, it is optional. Okay. So I don't, don't, you're not gonna see the, the chest burst scene of aliens, or aliens, excuse me. Okay. Um, but we will see that uh, uh, at some point. Okay. All right, let's start with a few minor tweaks okay, where we can see just a slight change to behavior. Okay. And a great example of that is plasmodium. Okay. Plasmodium is a protozoan that causes malaria, okay? and it's vectored by mosquitoes. Okay? Now, a female mosquito needs to suck your blood. Okay? She needs to take a blood meal in order to produce eggs. Okay? And typically, after a blood meal, a female mosquito is going to be very cautious. Okay? She's got what she needs. She's going to be less likely to bite. Okay? Plasmodium alters that behavior. Okay. So after an initial blood, feed, uh, blood meal, that mosquito is then active again, looking for another blood meal. Okay. Because once she bites another uh, human okay, or another vertebrate, she's transmitting uh, a, a specific, an asexual stage of the mosquito into that intermediate host. Okay. She's hoping for another mosquito to come and take a blood meal so that plasmodium can complete its life cycle. Okay. Killfish. Okay. Killfish can be infected by a uh, flatworm, okay. a fluke that harbors in the brain of the fish and causes the fish to swim erratically okay, and near the surface of the water. Okay. By swimming closer to the surface of the water, now potentially you've got a bird, predator, that can come and eat that fish. Okay. So these are a few examples of just minor tweaks altering the behavior 
of the host to enhance that transmission. But I know that's not what you came here for. Okay. Let's move to zombie ants. Okay. Now, my zoology students are not surprised that I've started with zombie ants because the majority of my examples do start with ants. Okay. <clears throat> so this is a very famous example of an animal where we see a very large alteration in behavior. Okay. And it's a fungal pathogen that's controlling the ant. And it's causing the ant to do some things that it's not normally going to do. Okay. And remember, all of this is to enhance the transmission and the life cycle of the fungus. Okay. So, uh, the fungus is uh, cordyceps. Okay. And cordyceps infects carpenter ants. Okay. Carpenter ants are arboreal, okay, this particular species, and they live in the trees. Okay, and that's pretty much where they stay. Okay. Fungus are not going to like those conditions. High up in the trees, very dry, not very moist. Okay. Fungus needs moist human environment for reproduction. Okay. So how do we get the ant to the forest floor where the fungus is going to benefit. Okay. Well, part of it is the release of spores. Okay. So spores are in microscopic structures that can attach to the body of the ant. Okay. And that's accomplished by one ant attaching itself specific, specifically to the mid vein of a leaf and releasing a boatload of spores um, upwards of 20 centimeters in diameter. So this big spray of spores all over the place. Okay. All right, so how is a foraging carpenter ant going to get affected if it lives primarily in the trees? Well, occasionally they got to go to the ground. Okay. They run out of room on the trees and they have to venture down to the forest floor in order to find a new tree to move up. Okay. In doing so, they can pick up spores on their exoskeleton. Okay. And these spores release enzymes. These enzymes penetrate the exoskeleton of the ant, and now that ant is infected. Okay. All right. The ant goes about its daily life. Okay it may return back up into the tree. Okay. But at some point, the fungi starts to infect the brain tissue of the ant. Okay. And it releases various chemicals. Okay. These chemicals target specific areas of the ant's brain. And it affects its mobility. The ant begins convulsing okay, uh, irregularly and it may even cause it to crawl back down onto the forest floor. Okay. So it's getting the ant back down onto the forest floor. Okay. Excellent conditions. All right. The ants or the fungus has its nice humid conditions, okay. but we still don't have the spread of the spores. Okay. So how are we going to infect new ants? Okay. So at some point, the ant marches off to its doom. And it's going to pick a spot roughly 20 or so centimeters off the forest floor, facing in a north uh, direction, a northward direction, and it's going to grasp, take its mandibles and grasp at a specific point in the mid vein of a leaf of the plant. Now, as it's doing this, Fungal spores right, are propagating throughout the body of the ant. And they're nourished by that. Right? Uh, they're, getting, they're getting nourishment from the blood of the ant. Okay? And as it attaches to that midvein, we get what's called the death grip. Okay? The death grip is called, it's caused by spores destroying the muscle tissue in the mandibles. Okay? So these muscles atrophy and it keeps the ant locked into that midvein. 
perfect position. Okay. And now we get more growth from the fungus. Okay. You can see this structure. This is called the stroma. Okay. And this is going to be the structure that releases the spores. So this begins to grow okay, and extend out from the head of the ant. Okay. And eventually, once it matures, boom, we get what's called the killing zone, as all of these spores are released onto the forest floor. Okay. Now, the fungus also protects itself. Okay. So while we're going through this process of producing this large uh, stroma and uh, spores, it's releasing antimicrobial chemicals. Okay. So it's preventing competition from other microorganisms. All right, let's do another ant example. This one is a little more complicated and involves multiple hosts. Okay. <clears throat> this is the, let's forget the name of this one here, lancelet liver fluke, okay, the lancelet liver fluke. So this is a flatworm and it lives in the ducts of the liver of grazing animals, like cows and sheep. Okay. Now, for the most part, if it's a mild infection, you're not going to see too much damage to uh, the uh, animal. Maybe they're colicky, a little diarrhea, but a large infection can cause cirrhosis in the liver. Okay. So it's definitely something you'd want to take care of uh, if you had uh, these animals. Okay. Now, they had identified this particular flatworm, but they couldn't ever figure out how these flatworms were moving from cow to cow, from sheep to sheep. Okay. Enter the snail. Okay. So in the feces of the cow, it releases an infective uh, or an embryonic egg. Okay. That egg is ingested by the snail. And this isn't going to be the first instance of snails eating poop. You're going to see more of this. Okay? So the egg is ingested by the snail, okay? and it moves to a second stage called the cercaria. Okay? The cercaria start to infect the body of the snail. The snail defends itself. Okay? And within the body of the snail, it produces sort of a slime ball. And it leaves these slime balls behind. It's a way to get rid of that parasite. Okay. Enter the second intermediate host. Okay. This is Formica. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> this is a type of ant that doesn't mind eating little slime balls from snails. It's okay with that. Okay. Now, once it does that, the parasite moves on to its second stage, okay, and that's the metasicaria. Okay. Now, the metasicariae, for the most part, are going to hang out in the abdomen of the ant. Okay. But how do we get from ant to cow or to sheep? Okay. Well, ingestion. Okay. So, similar to what you just saw with the uh, fungus ant, okay, these also climb out on top of vegetation and clamp down their mandibles okay, in hopes that a cow or sheep is going to come by, graze, and ingest that ant. Okay. But they do it a little bit differently. They split up. Okay. So we have a few cercarii that actually go into a specific spot in the brain of the ant. Okay. It's called the subesophageal ganglion, and it controls a lot of movement, locomotion, a lot of different features for the insect. Okay. And they just hang out there. So one to three of them are going to hang out in the head of the ant. The rest of them are going to turn into the metasicarii and hang out in the abdomen. So they're controlling the ant, and the ant will uh, wait for a specific environmental clue, nighttime. Okay, so as it starts to cool, okay, it gets colder, that ant says, you know what, it's time for my night shift. I'm going to go climb out 
and hang out on the top of this vegetation, sink in those mandibles, and I'm just going to wait. Right? And it does that throughout the night. But once it starts to warm, okay, it releases its mandibles, crawls back down, and gets to its day job. Goes about its normal activity. So it's temperature induced in terms of the actions of this parasite. And I use the word here, altruism. Okay? Altruism is a concept where we see um, some members of a community uh, sacrifice themselves okay, for the greater good. Okay? And that's exactly what a few of these Sicarii are doing. Okay? They're not converting into the metasicaria, into the infective state. Okay? They're staying behind to control the ant. Okay? And it's not the only example. Who wouldn't want a caterpillar bodyguard? Okay. This is an example of the voodoo wasp. Okay. So the voodoo wasp infects caterpillars. Okay. And upon injecting the, uh, the eggs, or well, the eggs are laid on the caterpillar, they then burrow into the body of the caterpillar and feed on the inside. So there we go, we're feeding on the inside. Okay. But they don't consume all of the caterpillar. Okay. Some are going to remain in the brain. Okay. So a few of these wasp larvae remain, on the brain, remain in the brain. The rest feed on the inside and then pupate on the stem very close to the caterpillar. Okay. And the caterpillar serves as a bodyguard. So there are other insects out there looking for a meal. And wasp pupa is an excellent meal. Okay. But if they approach, the caterpillar starts violently shaking back and forth. Okay. They've done studies that show that this is a very effective deterrent for predators. Okay. And those wasps that have a caterpillar bodyguard are going to have a much higher survival rate. All right. More worms. Here's another example. This is a flatworm once again. And its definitive or final host is a bird. Okay. And we need a snail, a poop-eating snail, in order to get, from, uh, to get through our intermediate host and eventually to our final host. Okay. Now, I've got a short video I want to show you. This is probably the greatest advertising I've ever seen in the animal world. Beneath this peaceful landscape, a snail has eaten parasites. They've turned it into a zombie. These spectacular, bizarre, bulging eyeballs are the snail's tentacles. Inside them, parasitic worms have begun an amazing feat of mind control. These parasites have taken over the snail's tentacles and its brain. It's all part of an ingenious plan to extend the life of the parasite and its offspring. The snail has become possessed. It is doomed now to follow the parasite's will. And the parasite is on the move, looking for another host. Next, the parasite needs a bird. Hypnotized, the snails march into the sunshine. They climb from the shade to the tips of exposed branches above. The snail's tentacles, engorged now by their possessors, have grown to resemble a maggot. And a maggot is the favorite food of the birds above.
in an instant. The bird attacks, and the parasite traps. The parasitic worm happily multiplies in the bird's stomach. Its final trick is to complete the cycle, but it will have little trouble, as the snails below graze on bird droppings. Snail poop. The new batch of mind-controlling parasites. Once they're eaten, the hypnosis of the snails will continue, and the life cycle of the parasite will roll on. All right, so minus the real dramatic music there, we see another trend of altering the behavior of that intermediate host, okay? causing the snail who really just wants to hang out on the, in, uh, in the shade, under the vegetation, to move out okay, into the open sun, and then, like I said, some of the greatest advertising I've ever seen. Okay. All right. Oh, sorry. I've got to switch between two things here. Okay. I apologize, more worms. Okay. Uh, these are horsehair worms, or Gordian worms. Okay. And this comes from the Greek legend, the Gordian knot, because this is how you're going to see them reproduce, and just this big kind of knotty swarm. Okay. And Gordian worms, or horsehair worms, are parasites of arthropods. Okay. And instead of forcing an arthropod to march out into the hot sun, okay, we're going we're gonna to force this arthropod to take a swim. Okay. So we're going to look at an example of crickets that are infected with these horsehair worms. The day starts normally enough. You give your pet some food and water. But later, in your pet's water dish, you find this, a hair worm. It didn't get here on its own. It came out of a little cricket. Don't believe me? Okay. These hairworms are gnarly parasites. They actually control a cricket's mind to get to their home, the water. The hairworm's journey starts innocently enough in a river as an egg, one of many in this long string. The eggs grow into squiggly larvae, which get eaten by a mayfly larva that also lives in the river. And inside the mayfly is exactly where the hairworm needs to be. The hairworm uses this pointy part to burrow into the mayfly's flesh. Then it curls up and waits. Because really, it's not after a mayfly, it's after a cricket. So it sits tight while the mayfly larva turns into an adult and heads to dry land, where it just might get eaten by a cricket that has no idea what it's in for. Inside the cricket, the hairworm goes at it, eating all the cricket's stored up fat for about a month. The cricket loses its chirp, but the hairworm doesn't kill the cricket because the worm needs a lift back to the water. Crickets usually avoid bodies of water. They're not great swimmers. So the worm takes over, boosting chemicals in the cricket's brain, which make the cricket walk around mindlessly until it happens to reach water. Scientists in France watch this infected cricket make a beeline for the pool. The 
airworm makes a break for it. Still going. Ugh, that's just, ugh. <laughs> They don't target humans. Ready for more? This one at the University of New Mexico has a whole lot of hairworms inside it. They don't waste any time curling around each other to mate even before they're fully outside the cricket. But it's more than a gruesome spectacle of nature. Learning about these hairworms can help scientists understand parasites like toxoplasma that make us very sick. As for the crickets, don't feel bad. If they don't drown, most of them survive their ordeal. At least that's what scientists have seen in the lab. They go back to being crickets and hopefully stay on dry land. Hi, it's Lauren. Who's hungry for more after? All right. Oops. All right, so more, less worms now. Okay. <laughs> but now we might get some optional bursting out of bodies. Okay. So my next example is probably the most remarkable in terms of altering an animal's behavior and it's for a very lovable animal, the cockroach. Okay. Everybody loves cockroaches, right? No? Okay. Maybe you won't mind what happens to this poor little cockroach. So this is the uh, or, uh, gypsy moth, okay? or gypsy uh, wasp. And what it does is it uses the cockroach as food for its larva. Okay. And in order to do that, it has to manipulate, okay, alter the behavior of the cockroach so that it will come along quietly and peacefully to its nest. Okay. All right, so this has maybe more just music here, but this, here's your jewel wasp. <clears throat> so step one here is to subdue the cockroach. Step two, walk it back to its burrow. Lay eggs on it. and then burst out. All right, so there it is. You got your bursting out of body. But not really the mechanism for that, because I think what you saw was, oops, sorry a cockroach that went along very peacefully with the wasp. Okay. And as I mentioned, it, it actually uses two different stinks. Okay. The first one that you saw there was to a specific area near the legs. It's called the prothoracic ganglion. Okay. And what this does is it causes the cockroach to not kick or do anything. Okay. It sort of subdues it. The best defense the cockroach has is to start kicking out its legs 
and that would knock the wasp off. But with that sting, it immobilizes the cockroach. Okay. And it also gives the cockroach time for its second sting. Okay. So the first one just immobilizes it. The second one targets another specific area in the insect's brain. Once again, that subesophageal ganglion. Okay. So this massive nervous tissue that really controls the whole body of the cockroach. Okay. And it takes its time. Okay. It can spend up to five minutes probing the brain of the cockroach looking for that specific spot. Okay. It has chemical receptors on its stinger that are able to find that specific area in the cockroach's brain. And once it does, it releases additional venom. And this venom is a little bit different. Okay. It's going to cause the cockroach uh, to release dopamine okay. and make the cockroach, um, or and, excuse me, and also an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Okay. And what it does is it prevents the cockroach okay, from uh, a uh, nervous response to some of its body parts. Okay. So it's inhibiting certain parts okay, and allowing for the, uh, the wasp to essentially lead the cockroach along okay, to the burrow. Okay. <clears throat> As you saw, once it makes it there, right, the cockroach uh, it has the eggs and larvae of the, um, the wasp emerge and feed on the cockroach. But it does one last thing that enhances the survival of the wasp larvae, and that's slow the metabolism of the cockroach. Okay. So it wants to make sure that when those larvae emerge, that they still have plenty of food to feed on. Okay. And the venom can last uh, over a week. Okay. And so it gives it plenty of time for the, the wasp larvae to feed on all that good cockroach and then emerge. Okay. All right. Can we use this to our advantage? Yes, we can. Okay. If you don't know, these are fire ants. Everybody loves fire ants. Okay. This is what's called a decapitating fly, or a forward fly. Okay. And it does exactly what the name suggests. Okay. This is its ovipositor, okay. and it uses that to lay an egg in the head of the ant. Okay. The larvae emerge, sort of feed on the fluids inside the head of the ant, and then burst out. Not out of the body, but out of the head. It's close enough, right? <laughs> now, why is this advantageous? Well, fire ants are an invasive pest in North America. Okay? And if we look at their native range in South America, there's over 15 different forward flies that attack these fire ants. Okay? So one of the things that the USDA is looking at is bringing in these forward ant feces as a way to control fire ants. Okay. Early returns are they're not that successful. Okay. Partly because they're only targeting workers. Okay. All right, last one. We've looked at a lot of different worms and arthropods, but I'd like to up the stakes a little bit. Okay. Let's move to a vertebrate. Okay. Toxoplasma. Okay. Toxoplasma gondii is a protozoan okay, that can infect humans and cause flu-like symptoms. Okay. Feel sick, lethargic. Okay. It can also be very detrimental to pregnant women. Okay. Um, toxoplasma is spread through cats. Okay. So if you have an indoor-outdoor cat okay, and you're pregnant, it's not going to be a good idea to go change the litter box okay, because they're spread through the feces of the cat. Okay. Now it has another intermediate host, okay, one in which you can get that full life cycle. And that's the rat. Okay. So a rat that goes through and it infects itself with toxoplasma okay, sees 
a real shift in its behavior. Right? It becomes dangerous. Okay? It takes a lot of risks. And one of the risks is it's attracted to cat urine. Right? Not a good idea if that's primarily what's going to eat you. Right? So, altering a specific part in the brain of the mouse, right? which they believe is due to dopamine, altering the dopamine levels. Right? And this controls a specific spot in the brain where you can see uh, fear and emotional control. Right? That's altered. Right? And the, the rat becomes more risky. Right? And so it's attracted to cat urine, okay? and lo and behold, you might find a cat where a cat is peed. Okay? The cat then consumes the rat, okay? and it's made it to its final host. Okay? Now, that's not where the story ends, okay? because toxoplasma can also infect humans. Okay? And I mentioned a few of the direct effects, but one of the cool things that toxoplasma can do is it can penetrate the blood-brain barrier and basically cyst, okay, form a protective shell inside your brain. And they're just starting to look at the possible effects of this latent infection, okay, but they do find that a lot more people are infected with toxoplasma than you think. Okay. In some areas of the world, 30 to 40 percent of people have toxoplasma infections. Okay. So, they've linked some of this to a higher incidence of toxoplasma infection in people with schizophrenia. Okay. They've also found evidence that toxoplasma slows your reaction time. Okay. <clears throat> So, if we look around in this room, who is infected with toxoplasma? We don't know. We may have zombies among us right now. <laughs> all right. That's all I have for you. Happy Halloween, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Or we can look at more worms. <laughs> I don't know which one of them is infected. <laughs> Are we good?